So welcome everybody to day two uh, of e-commerce week LA. We are really excited to have everybody here. Uh, if today's your first day, welcome. You missed some good stuff yesterday, but there will be plenty of options to get access to that content going forward. We've got a jam-packed day of content and sessions uh, for the future of digital identity. So um, my name is Tony Del Mercado. I am the COO and co-founder at Hawk Media. That means that mostly what I focus on are all of the teams uh, within our business, operations, finance, HR, uh, the services teams, the sales and marketing, and then uh, a bit around culture and process and systems and trying to keep things moving during these wild times, <clears throat> excuse me, which I know many of us are facing uh, together. And if everyone just can take a second to do a little temp check here in the general uh, Brand Club LA Slack channel, how's everyone feeling about today? What sessions are you looking forward to most? Uh, anything that you're, you're showing up with in terms of ideas or thoughts? Uh, let's see if anything pops into the general here. I can see people typing, that's a good start. I'm like, Erica's got the shades on, Hubes is pumped, showing up with tea, ready to listen. <laughs> Victor Oladipo, exciting stuff for sure. Jeannie's nice. Um, yeah, we've got a lot of really exciting things happening today. So uh, pumped to get up into it, stoked to be here, Bobby. Uh, 3D product info for sure, uh, good thanks. So as we get started, I uh, wanted to take a minute at the top, <clears throat> excuse me, to talk a little bit about Hawk Media's decision to transition to remote work and how to be remote in the future and how we see that interrelated um, with digital marketing and e-commerce. And the first thing that is really interesting and exciting for us at Hawk Media is that we now have uh, employees in 17 states, uh, which is great because we were really clustered around a couple uh, up until very recently. And so now having this ability to employ people across a, a broad and diverse geographic set of backgrounds has done a, a number of really cool things for our business. Uh, first and foremost, we have been able to solicit different opinions, different backgrounds, different perspectives that aren't necessarily glued to the coasts. And we've attracted some really nice uh, talent um, we anticipate that we'll probably be in closer to 25 states by the end of this year. And a high probability that we, we get to all 50 by the end of next. So having different perspectives and having different people with different backgrounds show up, I think is really exciting. Digital and all of these tools, all this communication has made it easy. And it's been easy for a long time. Um, and it was always in our plan uh, in order to continue to grow our footprint and to expand our base. Uh, but <laughs> how long till Hawk's going global? That's in the mix as well. So we really want to focus on domestic first and make sure that we've got that dialed in and figured out and then obviously continue to expand out into other corners of the globe, which is, which is fun. It's fun to think about logistically challenging with time zones and so on, uh, but still exciting nonetheless. So having all of these people in all these different areas, it also gives us access whenever uh, the world returns to the new state that it ultimately will um, to more opportunity, more events, um, more interesting businesses and entrepreneurs, more partners, um, deepen our roots in the ecosystems of cities that, you know, up until uh, all of this has happened, might not have been as high on the list in terms of what they have to offer from an e-commerce ecosystem or an entrepreneurial ecosystem perspective. So as we get closer to those opportunities and we have the ability to interact with more founders, uh, more business leaders, more thoughtful people, 
it's a really exciting consequence of being able to spread uh, your metaphorical wings, as it were, into all these different places. Um, the, the talent pools, I don't think I'm speaking uh, about anything that isn't widely known here, but the talent pools in some cities, once you get off the coast, are phenomenal. And they like working with cool brands. They like doing interesting things. Uh, they have ambitions about what they want to do with their careers. Uh, but oftentimes those resources or those opportunities have been limited. So being able to provide uh, greater resources, <clears throat> excuse me, greater access to interesting companies um, and dynamic career paths is also something that we're really excited to do. And there's also a compensation and a quality of life uh, that goes into this. Uh, I, for one, live in Boise, Idaho, and I'm not supposed to talk about it because too many people are moving here, but um, the quality of life for someone like myself uh, in a city like this compared to Santa Monica, where I lived up until uh, a couple of years ago is, is pretty different. And so we're excited to be able to provide great resources. And again, a great quality of life for some folks that aren't necessarily glued to the major metros and markets. Um, I think one of the most exciting things about remote work, <clears throat> excuse me, is how companies are gonna have to be thoughtful about their mission, their values, uh, their ideals, what they stand for. Um, all of us that you know, have the opportunity to work in e-commerce understand that the why and why should people care is really critical, uh, especially as you're building a brand, you're trying to get out there into the world. I think savvy consumers are more and more thoughtful and discerning about the brands that they choose to align themselves with. So as a company, we've also taken this on, uh, our, on our, upon ourselves to make sure that we dig our heels into our mission, which is to make um, marketing accessible to everyone, make great marketing accessible to everyone. And so in so doing, we also have to codify our values and what we stand for and the position that we take in the world. Uh, I'm really excited about sort of a, I guess, a, a reconvening around vision and mission and ideals, as opposed to, and some of you know this, the, the arms race that has happened within, um, especially the startup ecosystem about office space and who has the coolest desks and who has the broadest diversity of cold brews and kombuchas on tap. And a lot of what, what I refer to as like tchotchkes or baubles or these things that are meant to make a workplace attractive. I'm really excited about what the landscape looks like as businesses are forced uh, to be more thoughtful uh, about who they are and what they're doing because that's what's going to align talent and as you know, those of you that are on the line are thinking about how your businesses are evolving and what you want to accomplish, re reinvesting time and energy into the idea of what you are uh, to the world, how you're perceived, what your mission is, what your values are, um, and, and really digging in about what those things look like so that when you are acquiring talent and you're bringing people into the fold and getting them on the bus, everybody's working in lockstep towards some of these ideas and it's not as much about whether or not you've got a ping pong table and cool flat screens in every office which i also want to be clear our headquarters in la has all of those things um, and i think that we we felt for a long time that we had to keep up uh, in that way to make sure that we were able to attract uh, the level of talent that we wanted to continue to foster in our business so this isn't a cost cutting measure. I think sometimes there's dialogue or ideas about how not having physical space is a cost cutting measure. In our case, our plan is and always has been to actually put boots on the ground in physical space in more cities. Again, because our hand has been forced here a little bit, this just accelerates our timeline. So rather than have big anchor offices in LA and New York, we're now looking at nine cities to have smaller footprints that are also accessible for our clients, for our people, 
um, for uh, prospective clients. And so where we can all get together and still gather, because that's obviously a big piece that I'll talk about in a second as well. But maintaining that human connection as we're all remote is going to continue to be really important. So again, in a sort of circular way, we, we will have office space, but we won't necessarily have um, these huge monolithic places. And I, I'm excited about that. I think there'll be more of a community vibe. Uh, and I, I hope that for those of you that are on the line hearing about this, you're considering these options as well. Um, and the, the last couple of things about remote work and what this looks like for e-commerce and digital is uh, the economics of it, right? So it's not a strictly economic move to cut out a headquarters or something like that, but there is obviously an advantage in not having office rent in the same way that if you didn't have a mortgage or something like that. But that allows us to then redeploy that capital to invest in tools, um, to invest in people, uh, to invest in partnerships, to invest in other personal and professional growth uh, initiatives, <clears throat> excuse me, for, for our whole team. So it's not about putting that money back into founders' pockets. And as you're looking at this through an e-commerce lens, sure, there may be some more margin in there, which is um, potentially beneficial, especially if you're in a business where those margins are thin. But if you look at what else you can do with that capital resource and how you can invest that back, whether it's in supply chain or in marketing or in uh, people development internally, uh, and you think about all the good that we can do uh, for our organizations or for our businesses, with that surplus in capital, for us, that really tips the scales towards this idea of remote work and how we're gonna to continue to foster uh, an environment where we can get a lot done and we can be really, purpose, uh, really purposeful um, in our talent acquisition, in our career paths, in our people development, uh, and have those resources again available. Now, the last thing I'll talk about with remote work that is uh, potentially really challenging or again, just requires a level of thought and rigor is this idea of culture. And I've always thought culture is a word that gets just thrown around a lot by uh, folks. And there's probably more books on culture or cultivating culture than there are you know, across a, a variety of other workplace initiatives or ideals. And culture is a bit nebulous. Right. So conversation recently with several leaders within our business about remote work and the interrelationship between remote work and culture. So if culture isn't well articulated, uh, speaking with one leader in our business who said, you know, I have a culture and I want to make sure that as we're adding new people that I don't get to physically interact with or see nearly as much. How do I maintain that culture? Well, the, the questions or the series of questions and the discussion that we had was really around this idea of what is that culture and how is it defined, right? Um, do you have a culture of execution? Do you have a culture of belonging? Um, there's a great Google study done a long time ago about the number one thing that people um, desire in effective teams is intellectual and emotional safety. So how do you create a culture where people feel safe? They can take risks, they can pursue their ambitions, they can be supported by leadership. Um, for, for us in our business, and what I encourage everybody that I talk to about this now in a remote environment, is to really codify what that culture is, to really codify what those values are. Again, it's interrelated to this idea of corporate mission and values or enterprise level mission and values, but to have a specific culture within your pod or within your management group, describing what those things are that you're about, right? So if you think about, there's a, a book called Start With Why, uh, which is uh, pretty simple conceptually to follow. Basically starting with why, why does your business exist? And then there's the what, there's the mechanics and the how. Uh, but I think what's really, really critical is once you've got those things in product market fit and you've got processes and understanding and there's optimizations within whatever organization or business you're in, then you get to the opportunity to think about how does it feel? 
how does it feel to go to work? How does it feel to have an interaction with a client or a partner or a customer or a coworker or a manager or a direct report? And really scribing out what those things feel like will help everybody when it comes to remote work and when it comes to having that culture that's cultivated as the businesses continue to grow. Now, what's great is that the opportunity to do this is so huge right now. People are just starving for human connection. Uh, we have interviewed tons of HR professionals. Uh, we also have had the opportunity to interact with other business leaders about this concept about how do you make remote work feel um, like it has in the past in these offices that have vibrant cultures and people get together and care for one another. The sad reality of this is that it's, it's probably not going to happen. Uh, I'm sure everybody, ironically, sitting on this Zoom call right now, isn't in love with the idea of staring at Zoom after hours for a happy hour or a forced get together. I think those things were good proxies for in-person collaboration and I think they worked for a little while. I think it's harder to do now with the same group of people. When you're at a virtual event like e-commerce week LA, obviously there's the opportunity to engage with and interact with new people, new faces, new experiences. And so there's a little bit of an extra level of excitement or enthusiasm for that. But the same group of people getting together on the same Zoom call uh, every, every week uh, might start to lose its luster. So from a cultural perspective, as we transition into remote work and what we've found to be effective is what you can do to bridge the online and offline gap. So thinking about how uh, people live their lives offline and then bring that back to work in this digital disconnected space. One of the things that we've had uh, for a long time at our company is called Operation Keep It Tight which is basically just a sort of shared social workout uh, group. And there's a small amount of competition and people posting multiple workouts and pictures of what they're up to. So we found that that carried over really well into the digital space where our company was able to do things offline or do things in the real world that then they could share or foster uh, some level of communication around. Uh, I'm also very glad that sports are back. We have a a pretty uh, enthusiastic group as it relates to fantasy football where people are doing things that are offline, uh, they're sitting at home, they're interacting in some ways, and then coming back to the table um, in a digital atmosphere and going through a bunch of different stuff. So the, the transition again from in-person to remote is gonna take some extra effort when it comes to describing the mission of the companies, um, the values, the culture, and how that feels. But I would really strongly encourage everybody that's listening this morning to make that extra effort to put those things to paper and to make sure that you, your leadership team, your peers, uh, whoever you work with are aligned around what we want to be about so that you know what those things are going forward and we're not making assumptions about, hey, because it felt this way in person, it's going to feel this way virtually because many of those conversations that happen just in passing or over a ping pong table or a coffee pot uh, are really difficult to replicate. So I think starting with the values, starting with the whys and the culture is gonna continue to be super duper important, okay? So that's, that's what's up with Hawk, that's what's up with remote work and we're pretty excited to continue this adventure and again, for us, we're fortunate that it was in the plan to continue to expand geographically. That's just been accelerated quite a bit by uh, COVID and everything that has happened there. So that is that. Now, before we dive in to the first session of the day, which will start in about, looks like seven minutes here, I uh, wanna quickly give a shout out to one of e-commerce week LA's sponsors, ShipBob. ShipBob is a tech-enabled 3PL that fulfills e-commerce orders for direct-to-consumer brands. Their mission is to make you more successful online by providing best-in-class logistics so your customers don't go elsewhere. Um, their logo 
on our eCommerce Week LA website. Uh, we'll click through for more information and you can uh, check everything out there. Now, I guess before I introduce this next panel, again, if you're in the Brand Club uh, general Slack channel, do you have any questions on remote work, um, the future of remote, or any ideas or thoughts about that? If not, we'll probably just go ahead and intro. See some typing happening. I promise I see people typing, so we'll see if they actually come through here. There we go. Okay, good question. So top two tips I'd suggest uh, to other leadership considering remote that don't know if they should make the jump. Two biggest things to consider. Um, one is geographic expansion, part of your business strategy. So does it serve your business? Does it serve the ambitions of your company or your value proposition to have more geographic reach. Uh, if it does, then right away, I would say that's kind of a binary decision. You'd say yes, then great. Makes tons of sense um, to have a distributed workforce, right? The second one is that if you have a talent pool, uh, a, a staff that is fairly homogenous, and I don't mean in terms of uh, ethnicity or gender or race or um, socioeconomic diversity. Actually, I do mean that one a little bit. But if you look at a, there's a story I heard a long time ago about perspective and about the business case for diversity of perspectives, which is if you keep um, your ketchup in the fridge or you keep your ketchup in the cupboard. Um, I don't like ketchup in general, so it doesn't apply to me. But if you run out of ketchup or you run out of peanut butter, um, some people keep peanut butter in the fridge, some people keep peanut butter in the cupboard. If you run out of one of them, all of the replacements that you look for for that spread or topping are gonna be within the paradigm where you keep that thing. So if you keep your peanut butter in the fridge, you're out of peanut butter, you're gonna look for replacements in the fridge. If you keep peanut butter in the cupboard, when you run out, you're gonna look for replacements, at least immediately, right? So the same thing can be said for talent diversity and again, uh, a background of experiences. So I think considering whether or not your business is gonna be served, not just the first piece, which is the business strategy of having a geographic footprint that's larger, but the second factor is, will your business be served by having different voices, different opinions and different backgrounds in the room when it comes to growing the business. And I, I emphatically say yes on the second part. Um, another consideration is just whether or not you have a, a marriage to a physical space. Um, because there's so many great 3PLs like ShipBob and there's all these other places that are able to facilitate e-commerce that are entirely virtual. Uh, for nine out of 10 businesses, the idea of a distributed workforce is really exciting. Now, again, like I just spent about 15 minutes talking about, if you don't have really well articulated values and a mission statement that people can rally behind, I think it's gonna be harder to get alignment across a geographically diverse group of people. So it's really important to get that stuff super dialed in before uh, you make that leap. So Angel, good question. Um, I don't know if we have time for one more or if I should just, Go ahead and intro, um, or I shouldn't say intro, but 
I guess we'll just start to transition into this now because I see some folks showing up. So this is the uh, second day of the e-commerce week LA. We're really excited uh, for everything that's gonna happen. Uh, it's the new frontier of digital marketing. So technology and algorithms are advancing and becoming smarter. So marketers have to follow suit if they want their brands to stay relevant. Today, we're gonna to take a trip into the future uh, with e-commerce week LA as we dive into radical new and cutting edge digital marketing tools, technologies and strategies along with the brightest minds in the industry. So we're gonna enhance every aspect of your marketing mix at the future of digital identity. This holiday season is going to be unlike any other. Uh, according to McKinsey, COVID has launched us five years into the future of digital adoption. How can your brand stand out when digital channels are flooded with advertisers? Today, you're gonna join experts from Google, Riot, and Ventana to learn how 3D and AR can be used to stand out, uh, increase online conversions, and reduce returns with our first panel of the day. How to apply 3D and AR to your marketing mix to stand out. So I will flip to one of you, um, but it's good to see you. Ashley, are you driving? Ashley Crowder, are you there? Hello. Fantastic. How's it going? I will also say one of the things that's cool, and Ashley, I saw you on uh, another event. I don't know if it was last week or a couple of weeks ago, but it's so fun to see your name keep popping up because I feel like we've been running around in the same circles uh, for like seven, eight years now. It's uh, it's pretty awesome to see you continue to succeed and your team get bigger and all that fun stuff. So. We're glad to have virtual you. circuit. It's uh, <laughs> you can do way more than real conferences. So. Indeed. All right. Well, uh, hats off to you. Um, enjoy the panel. I'll be back afterwards. Okay. Thanks so much. Um, well, welcome uh, again to the e-commerce week LA. It's so great to be here. Um, uh, as I mentioned, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Ventana. We have a cloud platform that makes it really easy to manage uh, and distribute 3D models of products, whether that's through e-commerce or advertising platforms. And we work with some awesome ad platforms from Google to Verizon to Facebook and Riot. Um, and I've got these amazing people to join me today. Uh, so I'll start off uh, with letting them introduce themselves. Um, so Graham, do you wanna go first? Sure, thanks Ashley. Um, I'm Graham Swarsa, head of partnerships for Riot. I lead the BD team. Um, Riot is the immersive arm of Verizon Media. So we are building um, immersive formats that, that, that are now ubiquitous across all of our properties. Um, for those who don't know, Verizon Media is you know, the culmination of um, Yahoo Sports, Yahoo Finance, TechCrunch, Engadget, Autoblog, Huffington Post, um, AOL. So a, a, a broad swath of media properties and, and we've brought um, AR across all of those properties um, online and on apps through through our the Verizon Media Immersive platform. So excited to talk to you guys today. Yeah, thanks so much for joining. And Ipshita from Google. Hey everyone, I'm Ipshita and I'm on the partnerships team for emerging consumer experiences at Google. Over the past year or so, I've led commercialization for a 3D ad product called 3D Swirl and work with brands and agencies to consult on what 3D tech is and how it could be useful to their business and the ecosystem. I've been at Google for eight years now and prior to Google, I have experience in the telecom and auto industry. Thanks for having me, excited to join you all. Awesome, and Michael from Facebook. Hey all, I'm Michael. I'm a product manager at Facebook, specifically focused on AR commerce. I work under the Spark umbrella, which is our AR platform for all of our apps from Instagram to Facebook to Messenger. I specifically work on AR solutions, supporting shopping and advertising and all of the commerce uh, solutions. 
uh, focusing from the customer side. So, you know, creating the right technologies and the right tools within our apps to the merchant side, to creating the right tools and creation and publishing solutions for merchants and creators. Yeah, and it's pretty amazing. I, I saw um, a stat uh, the other day that Facebook has now become the largest AR platform, which is pretty incredible. Um, and, and all of you are really enabling AR at scale because whether it's Google Swirl or Riot with Verizon or Spark AR with Facebook and Instagram, you guys have created these amazing tools where people don't need to start from scratch and build a custom app, which is pretty cool. So how are uh, each of your advertising platforms thinking about 3D and spatial computing today? And, and where do people kind of get started? Whoever wants to jump uh, in. So <laughs> I, I think for Verizon Media, you know, as, as powered by Riot, um, I, I think, our look is, you know, we know 3D formats are the future. They they offer a deeper level of engagement and interactivity that I think audiences are used to now and, and consumers are used to now. Um, still growing, obviously, you know, that lexicon of clicking through and interacting with objects in your space. Um, I think for us, we're not a camera first uh, ecosystem. So our use cases are typically, um, entertainment or utility. So it would come in the form of AR editorial where a story was created in editorial content. It could be a branded series for a brand. So that's the branded series are one way that the, the, um, the ad side of the house is looking at things, but then there's also AR ads, right? So allowing, creating the experiences that allow people to interact with the objects that, that, that are of interest to them, whether they're um, consumer goods, uh, appliances, furniture, sunglasses, you know, things like that, really driving a deeper level of engagement between the objects of interest and the audience, I think is, is um, you know, really enticing for the, the ad side of the house, for sure. Yeah, definitely. I mean, the new word that I've heard recently is digital, like the physical digital space. And that's kind of what 3D is, is giving people that physical experience from the comfort of their own home. Uh, and, and studies have shown once people are comfortable buying from home, they're gonna keep doing that. So whenever COVID is finally over and we can go back to our normal lives, whatever people got used to purchasing from the comfort of their own home online, that's gonna continue. And it's pretty cool. And uh, Ipshita, I know when I tell people about Google Swirl and like you can advertise in 3D on Google, they're kind of amazed. Um, I don't know how you guys are uh, thinking about taking that. I know we've got some examples later to show, but. Right. So our team at Google really started thinking about how 3D tech can be leveraged and how can we really make it more accessible for users, brands, and partners, right? So the thinking was focused on how can 3D tech be more helpful and useful for that end user. So like you said, for example, if I'm a consumer looking to buy a shoe, it would be pretty helpful if I can look at a 3D model of a shoe, check out, let's say the features, the textures, et cetera, and then take it one step forward and really see that shoe in my space, maybe on my table. So it'll bring me the user a few steps closer to making that purchase decision. I think 3D and AR are incredibly powerful in helping build that immersive experience for users all centered around providing that useful contextual information. Definitely. And one thing I'll mention is, you know, sometimes when people think about AR, it's like, oh, well, we need try it. We, we need the animation. We've actually been working with a client. And as you said, just being able to see the 3D model and then place it in your environment, keeping it very simple, has more than doubled conversion rates for them. So it's very powerful. So I would say, don't feel like it's overwhelming and you have to create this intense experience. Just starting with that 3D is kind of like a good phase one, I would say. And then Michael, I mean, with Spark AR, I've used it. Uh, and I have to say, it's, it's really amazing how there's so many kind of pre-built experiences that you can customize and you don't necessarily need to be a developer, which is pretty amazing. Yeah, so building on top of that, echoing what Ipshita said, it, it definitely starts with the customer, uh, helping the customer, you know, at, at least for uh, what we call 
AR try-ons, uh, trying out a IKEA table in your space, seeing if it makes sense in your living room, uh, seeing if it fits kind of kind of your space and your your uh, style, right? And we think that's really important, and it'll drive conversions. But something else that we've also seen a lot of success with is not just those try-ons. We've seen AR help brands and customers build a, a deeper connection, right? Um, we've seen uh, face filters from uh, brands and different types of merchants. We've seen uh, with Starbucks, we've seen uh, you can scan a cup and you can see cool animations and you can see cool uh, effects on the cup. And we've seen that help build the brand's awareness. We've seen customers build a deeper connection and we've seen customers get excited and share these types of experiences. And so we think it's definitely about try-ons, definitely about helping uh, customers build confidence in their purchase, but it's also about helping uh, brands build their awareness, help customers build a deeper relationship uh, with the brand. That makes a lot of sense. And so obviously, you know, to kind of start um, you need 3D models, you know, Graham, you had a really interesting when we were, did our pre-call for this about just what is consumption mode and, and what are all the different aspects that go into this because you don't want to forget about the audio and, and everything else. Yeah, I, I think it's, uh, it's something that we think about a lot. It, it's, you know, sometimes people think of oh, audio as an older format or, you know, um, but we really look to honor each of the consumption modes that we're likely to find our audience in. You know, if you're driving, you're more likely to be in an audio mode and listen only mode. So are we providing content that, that, that um, serves that audience? Uh, is it an article that somebody wants to read on one of our properties? You know, Yahoo News, Yahoo Finance. Um, do you want to see a video about of the content? And are you deeply engaged and someone who's curious and looking to find your own perspective uh, uh, in an environment or in a story or with objects? You know, we have AR for that. So you can engage and drive your own experience and find your perspective. Um, so really honoring that broad swath of um, um, consumption modes is really important for us. And as it relates to, you know, kind of the Verizon, um, the way we look at you know connecting people to each other and and what they love you know you look at um you know 5g is really changing the immersive content and the, the fidelity of the experiences that can be be um, delivered and so when you look at the generations of wireless connectivity really what it's doing is is um connecting people more deeply right 1g you had a voice two people were separated, you can connect them by voice. 2G, you've got text and voice. 3G is now data, you can explore the internet. 4G brings video, FaceTime, similar to the, this conference. And now 5G, you've got interactivity, right? So deeper engagement, another consumption mode, um, 3D AR formats. Um, so really for those who are inclined, um, deeper engagement to find your perspective into any given story. Definitely, and, and we've been lucky enough to be a, uh, a exploring the 5G lab in LA, which unfortunately was supposed to open right when COVID happened, uh, but very excited to get to test some things on, on that 5G node. Um, with that said, I think it's interesting when you talk about consumption mode, I mean, and I would put it to Michael and Abshita, you know, on Facebook and Instagram, I'm looking for that selfie and interactive experience. Whereas Google, I might be, I want to find this item that I want to purchase. Um, and how does that kind of define what you guys are are creating, I guess, in this space? Yeah, at least for Facebook, um, we we definitely are trying to cater towards, you know, the the, the selfie consumer, uh, the person who likes to use face filters, but Something else that we're also very heavily invested in is Facebook shops and IG shops. So we also want it to be a destination for you to find your favorite brands, connect with your favorite brands, and ultimately make that purchase uh, with your favorite brand too, right? And so something that, that we already have uh, today on our platform on Facebook and IG shops is um, uh, we have a select few pilot partners, uh, specifically in the beauty category, and they've created, uh, worked with us to create uh, lipsticks, uh, eyeshadows, all in AR. 
And so you can actually go on Facebook shops. And if you're, you know, a little bit on the fence or want to see how this lipstick looks on you, you can actually go on the product details page, click try it on an AR, and you can build confidence in your uh, purchase. And you can see, and you can see how it looks on you exactly, right? And so that's something that we're also really excited about too. So it's getting closer to that uh, purchase, getting closer to that transaction and helping consumers uh, in that whole life cycle from brand awareness all the way down to helping them build confidence in their purchase. That's great. And, oh. and I would also agree with Michael. I think we are super excited about uh, AR try-ons. And two other ways brands can use 3D models is one is for organic or AR and search experience. So Google can index and surface uh, 3D objects as part of web results. However, still early, uh, limited to a few verticals only, we are testing it out. The other really big way is to use these 3D models in banners or creative uh, display creatives as part of that media mix. So brands can really create a more visually compelling and immersive experience with 3D. So um, another example, imagine looking at a car in 3D, right, in a creative and just being able to customize it by using a color selector or looking at additional product details via hotspots versus just looking at a flat image provides a ton of value. So I think that visual story via 3D and AR is certainly more compelling. Definitely. Um, well, I know we've talked a lot and everything we're talking about is super visual. Um, so I'm gonna take this moment to share. Uh, we've got some fun examples for people. Um, great. So if you can see my screen. Uh, so yeah, so at Ventana, you know, we drink our own Kool-Aid. Uh, we created our own uh, Google Swirl ad. Um, so with this purse. So anyone at home, if you have your phone on you, you can take it out and scan this QR code and it will actually take you to this uh, Google Swirl banner ad we made. So you can actually see what it looks like. Um, pretty cool because as you scroll, the purse will automatically move and then you can actually take your, your cursor or finger and move it around and, and see it from all directions, which is pretty fun. Um, and I'll have these posted later in the Slack channel if you guys don't have time to get your phone out right now. Um, next, we've got uh, a case study actually, Ipshita, if you wanna review this one. Yeah, for sure. So a little bit of background here. So since 2019, we ran a number of pilots and we focused on 3D creatives with our brand and agency partners. And we noticed that the results were pretty significant. Um, so the engagement of these 3D ad units is almost 3x times higher than other rich media creatives, which is a pretty strong signal that users are really interacting with 3D products. We had data from third-party brand lift studies, which in indicates that 3D units influence positive purchase intent and brand favorability. So on the slide here, you can see an example of a perfume brand which leveraged 3D tech to create a beautiful brand story, which highlighted the ingredients. So the interaction here was pretty cool. So as you can rotate, as you rotate the bottle, you can view the ingredients of the perfume in 3D. The engagement as well as brand equity metrics were pretty strong and significant. Um, if I talk about some strong use cases of using 3D units, that includes product launches, where brands want to drive, let's say, product awareness, or cases where it makes sense to highlight uh, product features and functionalities or textures, like in the previous example of that handbag. Yeah, I read this case study. It's, it's pretty amazing. Um, and then next, I've got some examples. Uh, from Michael from Facebook. Yeah, so in this example, this is already live. So if you guys have Instagram on your phone, you can actually try this out. So this is an example from one of our pilot partners, uh, Nix Cosmetics. So if you go on to their Instagram profile and you click on their shop, uh, we have a little filter uh, that you can search for or filter for uh, try it on with camera. You can click on a, in this example, we have, I believe, a gloss, and you can click on that gloss, and then you can actually try it on, see how it looks uh, on your lips, um, and then, again, 
uh, ultimately buy it if you think it looks uh, good on you. Yeah, this is great. And again, I'll make sure to post this in the Slack uh, for, for people to have directions. Um, we had a quick video as well, just to show. Awesome. Um, and I know you also shared a, a Walmart example, which I'll make sure to post uh, in the Slack channel as well. And this was kind of that, um, seeing if that desk actually fits in your home. I know once COVID started, I finally bought patio furniture, but I was taping out to make sure it all fit. And this would have been so much easier, uh, which is great. And then um, the, the last example, it's another QR code if you guys want to test out uh, the AR. Ventana helped, uh, it's kind of in partnership with Riot and Dignitas, the esports team. Um, Dignitas has merchandise and as an esports team, of course you need that to be in 3D. Uh, so if you actually go to their store, um, you can find a lot of their hats and jerseys are actually in 3D. And then you can use the AR mode um, to test it out. Uh, and what's cool is, you know, Ventana software was used to process distribute the 3D assets um, and Riot is, is taking that and doing some really cool carousel ads and things, uh, which has been really great to see that partnership because it takes, takes a lot of different moving pieces to make it happen. Um, but that's great. And so with that said, you know, how do people get started with this? You know, having a product, you know, is different requirements than that lipstick. So I would love to hear kind of from each of you, how could a brand get started quickly and, and easily? Yeah. Uh, so for us, uh, for Facebook, I would definitely recommend before you get started with, with anything AR or 3D, I, I would first say recommend uh, understand what you're trying to do, uh, understand the objective, understand uh, what you're trying to achieve and what results you're trying to get out of it. And, I, and then what I would then recommend is how does AR and 3D fit into that objective, fit into your guys' strategy? Um, because the, the worst thing that you could do is take 3D and use it for the wrong thing. Um, I think both you as the merchant and the customer will not be as excited about that. So definitely understand your objective first. The second thing I would say is uh, once you've got the right you know, strategy and once you understand how AR fits into that, the second step is creating your AR assets. Um, the cool thing is if you already have 3D models uh, and 3D assets, it's relatively easy to convert those into Spark assets. So we have a bunch of tools uh, in Spark Studio that are that make it super easy to convert those 3D models into Spark assets. Something else that we recommend is working with a creative agency. Uh, so we have a bunch in what we call the Spark Partner Network. And this is just a network of vetted uh, creative agencies who are very familiar with Spark and they can help you, uh, you know, convert or even create brand new spark effects from the ground up. And then kind of the last step, uh, which is already live, is if you want to start an ad campaign, all you got to do is publish your spark asset um, and then start an ad campaign and link your spark asset to the ad campaign and it should go live. Um, so that's pretty much all brands need to do to get started with an AR ad campaign. Yeah, Michael, right. talks about that. and just in general, I think it's important to answer the question, why AR or why, why 3D, right? And, and it starts for me with what story are we looking to tell and how can we leverage the qualities of AR and 3D to tell that story more immersively and, and, and again, offer um, you know, per, new perspective to, to users to be able to navigate an environment or an object um, in a way that allows them to see for themselves um, the benefits. You know, and I think um, if she'd have mentioned, you know, spinning the product to see the ingredients, I mean, that that's a case study that that we see today in stores. You know, younger generations are more kind of concerned with what's in it 
like, okay, great packaging, but what's in it, right? Mm -hmm. And so when people physically pick objects off the shelf, the first thing they do is flip it around and look at the back. So that's a great, you know, use case for how someone yeah. would, would take that real life action and, and mimic it in, in a 3D or, or AR uh, use case. Yeah, and I would also say it depends on where, you know, obviously what demographic and market are you selling into? We were talking with a client um, the other day and it's, you know, it's a face makeup moisturizer um, company, but they do a lot of sales in China and in China, the bottle and how pretty the bottle is, is important. And it's kind of like they, you know, purposely kind of sh like a place to show off like all the different makeup, which is like a very different like for me, I'm just trying to keep my like counters clear, you know, um, but it was like a very unique thing. And they're like, no, AR and seeing how beautiful this makeup bottle is, is very important to that market, which is interesting. Yeah, and I would agree the approach is really important, right? You have to think about what does 3D or AR unlock? It's, it's okay to just start with a couple of assets and make it part of the media strategy. So what we do is we typically tell brands to test it out, measure the ROI, and then see if it makes sense for their business. But I think it's really important to think of the use case first. Um, so at Google, we do have these technical specifications, which of course tell you what file format and what size the assets needs to be. And similar to Facebook, we also have a partner program. So we always tell brands to reach out to our partners who are of course experts at optimizing, building 3D assets and working end to end with the partners to give them the kind of brand experience they want. Yeah, and just um, to kind of explain for people who might be totally new to 3D. Um, so when we say a 3D asset, that's like, you know, a 3D file uh, that is representing the model, the geometry and the colors and the textures. Um, and there's hundreds of 3D file formats. Um, and it really is because depending on your design program, they have their own proprietary formats. So whether you're using 3DS Max or Maya, or if you're an apparel company, Clo and Browseware. So I would say kind of where I tell people to start is, do you design in 3D today? Go talk to your design team because you probably have some 3D models. You know, when we worked with Lexus five years ago, they're like, we don't have 3D. I was like, you do because you designed your car. We can find this, you know? Um, so that's kind of step one. And then the main file types you, you wanna know are GLTF, um, which is quickly becoming the standard. It's the standard for web and for Android AR. And then USDZ, uh, which has really become the standard for uh, iOS AR because you know Apple always has to be different. Um, but those are, if you have those two, it's good. And then um, Ipshita mentioned optimization. So a lot of times your initial 3D design file is huge. Like it has every detail to manufacture it. You can't put that on your website or mobile, like it would crash. So when we say optimization, it's just ways to kind of shrink that file down, but make sure it still looks good and looks the same. Um, and so, you know, that's something we have in Tana spent a lot of time with. Um, happy to answer questions later, but that's just kind of a, a general baseline. Um, and that's for the 3D products, whereas with like lipstick and makeup, um, that's really just like a material or, or, or texture. And Michael, you might be able to dive more deeper into this, but can you, within Spark AR, can you kind of just dial in those colors there? Or how are people importing those colors? Yeah, good question. So right now uh, we have a tool called Spark Studio, and that's where a lot of our uh, design and creative agencies help a lot of our merchants. So you saw NYX, you saw Anastasia, uh, these creative agencies build these, uh, you know, lipstick effects and beauty effects all within Spark Studio. Uh, we also have, you know, some tutorials out there to help people if they want to go try it themselves too. Uh, but yeah, the Spark Studio would be the right tool to kind of dial in the right texture, the right color, the right amount of glossiness and glitter and things like that. Cool. Um, I'm going to go play with that later, <laughs> like a filter for, for Zoom. Um, that's great. And obviously we've talked about all the positives. I mean, are there any bad examples? You know, what should people avoid when they're looking to do this? 
So at least for Facebook, uh, we're, we're so super focused on making sure that things go well, uh, that we haven't really had any major examples of things going bad. Honestly, I, I might lose my job if, if things went actually yeah. <laughs> bad. Um, but uh, one kind of uh, funny anecdotal story is we had a partnership, uh, an AR try on partnership for a desk with Walmart. Um, the one thing is make sure you have enough product in stock. So as soon as the AR uh, ad campaign went live, I believe in about an hour or two, all of their products sold out and they obviously had to stop the campaign. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. It, it might be more effective than you than you originally thought. Um, but something else that we've seen just in a very controlled setting in a, in a user research lab, um, we were starting to uh, ask the question, like, how does quality uh, affect a customer's perception? And so uh, we've, we've never launched anything that's bad quality, but we have done some, some uh, user research in the lab to, to understand how quality affects it. And this should be obvious to everybody, but the, the higher quality your AR effect is and the higher quality your 3D model is, the more your customer uh, resonates and understands and builds confidence in that, uh, you know, in that product and in that uh, 3D model. So something I would highly recommend is, you know, just do your due diligence, make sure that the, your, whatever you're creating is high quality. Yeah, that's a really great point. Cause I think, you know, for years we've had, you know, impeccable photography that can show the, the, the quality of, and, and set the scene just so right. And, um, there's a there's a gap that we need to bridge in in 3D and AR where you know if somebody's interacting with a product it better be photo real top quality cuz right if it gets like kind of cartoonish then you lose the whole you know texture and sense of 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 what you're actually engaging with so you actually do more damage by having by putting out bad 3D or bad AR um, than you would by just putting a photo but if you can get it right, um, then it's the benefits as, as discussed um, by the panelists earlier with, with engagement, click through, purchase, you know, brands love it because it's as if you've tried something on. So return rates are lower um, on their end. So there's, you know, those benefits that can be pointed out, but yeah, getting it right and photo real um, is very, very important. And, and in our ecosystem, what that looks like is a lot of our artists and engineers came from major motion picture houses. So, you know, the, the Pixar and, and um, DreamWorks, they're used to like photo real top quality uh, workflows, which, which I think really helps with the experiences. Yeah, I will say devil's advocate a little bit, you are constrained in the size. You, you are very constrained in the size of that 3D file that will work in Spark AR, or Google Swirl, or just you know be able to load quickly on a phone. So it is that balance. And those you know beautiful 2D renders are, are usually done with a post-processing, like you hit render and it works for three days and it spits out you know, this beautiful 2D image. Whereas with 3D, it's, it's called real-time rendering because it's actually, you know, changing based on your lighting environment. So it right now, it will not be exactly the same based on those constraints, but the closer you can get, the better. I just, you know, it's never going to be exact. <laughs> but, uh, we're, yeah. we're everyone on, on this panel is working really hard to get there for sure. Right. And I can build on that a little bit. So 3D does make sense for a lot of verticals versus some others, right? Like, so for example, showing the interiors of a room effectively in high fidelity, again, that quality issue, right? Can be somewhat challenging, especially in the context of viewing that experience on a mobile phone, which anyway has a limited real estate. Definitely, definitely. But if we go back to kind of those use cases, it's, you know, being able to see it at every angle and of course, furniture, if you can actually see the size and how that fits is great. And then with the makeup, how that you know looks against my skin tone, that sort of thing is huge. Um, so great. And you know, what are some of the roadblocks that people might run into as, as they're trying to deploy this? And, and how would you guys mitigate that? I think one roadblock is cost. 
um, to engage in a new workflow to create assets. And I think the, the way that I look at that is, is really um, optimizing your workflow so that maybe you come up with a strategy that's 3D first. So you're redirecting, you're renaming dollars that you're spending on maybe graphic designers or editors, you know, and putting that toward getting that 3D asset made first and creating those experiences and then walking that asset back down across your um, delivery formats, whether it be video and or, or, or rendering it as a photo. Um, getting creative with how you rename or reallocate your um, your resources in order to have it make sense for your business. Um, find the partners that that can offer maybe conversion or creation services at a value um, that let you get a toe in the water with with you know okay I have a product I want people to be able to engage with it how do I you know reallocate resources in able in order to get that product made into a 3D asset um, and then deployed on what platform right how do i want to reach my audience and what platform is compatible with with um you know deploying these 3d or ar experiences yeah and just to touch on that a bit more i loved when we were chatting uh, you know last week of 3d is the highest level content so so if you start with 3d you can use it in ar you can use it on your website you can you can create 2d images from that 3d um, so if you start there and kind of think about like we have clients rep replacing photo shoots, you know, the Ikea kitchen catalog, not a single photo was taken. Those was all 3D renders, uh, which is pretty interesting. So, so it is kind of rethinking that entire content pipeline, but that one 3D file can go from the design group all the way to sales and marketing and end up, you know, saving costs at the end of the day. Um, but yeah, and then to Sheeta and Michael, like what roadblocks uh, have you guys seen with, with your platforms and how have they been mitigated? Yeah, so on, on Facebook, I, I wouldn't necessarily call them roadblocks. I'd call them more speed bumps. So uh, something that we found is there's a lot of interest from a lot of merchants for AR and 3D, uh, but there's this general lack of knowledge of how it effectively uh, uh, fits into their strategy or even where to start. And also what we found is not only on the merchant side is there this lack of knowledge, but also on the customer side. Um, I, I think for me, like I'm a very digital first, uh, I, I understand AR, but there's obviously customers outside of my demographic. Like for example, my mom, like I was talking to her about my job the other day and like how AR is can be hugely beneficial and she's just like, I don't understand this. And that that's something that we also need to solve too, um, if we want to make this technology ubiquitous. So um, kind of just a road bump is, or sorry, a speed bump is just, you know, helping companies understand the right strategy, helping them understand where to start, uh, like where to start with creation, how to start with their first ad campaign. And then driving enough awareness for customers to understand how to use it and understand how uh, it best, fit, best fits into their daily lives. Definitely. And I would say, I mean, COVID, the silver lining has been helping with all this. I mean, pre-COVID, my parents didn't know how to use QR codes. They're forced to use QR codes now. <laughs> they want to go to a restaurant, right? So uh, we are seeing this fast adoption. And I think it was McKinsey came out with this study that, that we've been launched five years ahead. Um, which is so great for, for all of our industries. So always trying to point out the silver linings in this crazy, crazy year. Um, and if Shida, what about you? Yeah, I, I would certainly agree. I think getting started, the first step is the hardest. I feel, I feel a lot of brands have to look at their media mix and see how they can evolve it over time. But if we can in the ecosystem show use cases, which makes sense, then I think we'll see the industry start adopting it faster and move towards this tech, which is still considered early tech, right? Um, and I think from a very broad industry level perspective, I think standardization of these technical specs for 3D assets, for AR assets has to also evolve at the same time. So I know there have been tons of efforts with the Kronos group, which is driving this work forward. 
Uh, but I think the faster we can get there, the better it will be for all stakeholders and partners involved in this ecosystem. Definitely. Um, we're part of the Kronos group too. So we're all pushing for GLTF to basically become the JPEG of 3D. Right. Um, yeah. So we're all, all working towards that. Um, and, and right now, because every platform has slightly different specifications. Um, so that's one thing, at least at Ventana, we finally just automated because we're like, just this is people were spending, you know, weeks of time recreating the same asset for Google or Facebook or Shopify's e-commerce site, whatever that is. And we're like, this is crazy. Um, so, so we can at least help solve that problem. Um, but yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Something else that I would add it again, this is more of a speed bump. It, there's a, a lack of, uh, almost precedence or, or previous examples to you. So for example, we've heard a lot of, uh, uh, merchants who are like okay i, I want to do ar it fits into my strategy like what should my baselines be for an ad campaign or what should my baselines be for you know ar engagement and um th those are things that that you know we th these merchants don't have a precedence for but as they start to experiment as they start to learn um they'll 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 figure out what the right baselines are what the right strategy is what the right precedence is and so that's why we call them speed bumps uh because we just got to get over that hump but um, yeah. Definitely, I like the optimism. And so, I mean, at least what we're doing with, with Riot and, and Dignitas is we did uh, only four products in 3D and we left the other products in 2D and we're, and we're kind of measuring. We're measuring uh, engagement and clicks and purchases and returns across all of them. And, and yeah, it's not the exact, you know, so maybe the main jersey just sells better than that t-shirt. Um, but at least gives us some type of, of baseline to look at. So we'll be um, releasing that case study probably in a, in a couple of months, which hopefully can be helpful to people. Um, so now that we've already launched ourselves five years forward, what happens in the next, you know, one, three to five years with its technology? What do you guys see kind of coming down the pipe and, and why should people be starting this now? Because, you know, I, I see it only becoming bigger and, and kind of consumers demanding it, you know, as they get used to it. I think for me, it's 5G, you know, again, being aligned with Verizon, it's, it's um, the currencies of 5G really lend themselves to supporting these formats on mobile devices in particular. Um, the, the two uh, uh, main ones are, are latency and throughput, right? You can put massive files um and have it in real time and so it, it enables interactivity uh, in real time without the stickiness that we're accustomed to now with with internet connection you know and the network needs to come online <clears throat> come further we need devices to support these types of activities on 5g we need experiences to be created that benefit from the currencies of 5g um, but it, as soon as we're able to start pushing the render off device um, now the phones don't have to work so hard. Batteries will last longer. You know, all these benefits that are, that, you know, able to be, um, you know, gained if, if, if all of the components of the network are working together correctly, um, I think are exciting. You know, it, it, it allows us to get the fidelity um, of experience that we, we would hope for. Um, on 5G, and so um, there's there's still a little little ways to go, but I think that's what we're working toward on our end, optimizing on the production side. What does that mean for moving large amounts of data over the network, but also on the user side? You know, what's the user experience um, as we toggle between 4G and 5G? You know, because we don't want to lock. 4G users out of a, a really compelling experience, but we also want 5G users to have a really supercharged experience, you know, to get the benefits of that network. So um, that's, that's a big driver for us is, is how we've seen it, it be able to benefit the, the experience. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so for me, how I would almost split this conversation is uh, you have the, the consumer or the customer side and the merchant side, right? For the customer consumer, like I really see deeper, richer, 
more advanced experiences and capabilities coming out in the next one to three to five years. So this allows the customer to, you know, get more photorealistic, to express themselves deeper, to try on, you know, different types of makeups that weren't previously possible. On the merchant side, I really see it, you know, being easier to create, uh, easier to publish, easier to manage your effects, and really have it be the centerpiece almost of your digital marketing or whatever types of campaigns that you want to do. And so when you kind of combine those two things, I really see AR as kind of uh, as a differentiator in the near term. So as a merchant, uh, you know, you can put this on your product details page and customers will be like, hey, this is new, this is unique. This helps me make my purchase. But, you know, five years down the road, I almost see it as a ubiquitous and almost as a table stake necessary. Just like right now, a merchant has to post a photograph of, you know, the lipstick and how it looks on a person on their product details page. It's going to be the same for AR too. People, uh, sorry, customers are going to require this uh, as part of their purchase uh, journey. And they're going to uh, have it be necessary and merchants are going to, you know, say, hey, we, we need to cater to the customer. We got to build all these air effects. Definitely. And uh, I always think about um, Gary Vaynerchuk, you know, he he's obviously an incredible advertiser, but he started like he was the first to really use email as advertising when like email was new and everyone opened every single email because it was exciting. Right. And he really capitalized on that. And I think AR and 3D is this currently undervalued medium to grab people's attention. And so it's going to become table stakes. So you might as well start now and, and be able to capitalize on that, you know, early user adoption, which is great. And Ipshita, what about you? Um, so I would look at it from a usage perspective as well. I think 3D and AR tech is increasingly proving its value. So users and brands alike will start thinking more and more about immersive and rich experiences and that demand for visually compelling experiences will increase. I honestly think we are still scratching the surface. The technology will continue to evolve, making it much easier for brands and partners to adopt. Um, I also think the ecosystem will evolve with more partners equipped with that technical know-how. And to Graham's point, I think 5G is really positioned to be that accelerator to support the full capabilities and the evolution of the tech going forward. Um, I feel the possibilities are really endless and honestly pretty exciting if you combine 5G and computer vision, AI, cloud computing, and all of that good stuff. So really exciting stuff is coming up soon. Definitely. And, and the one thing I would add is just the explosion of esports and gaming. And, you know, at Ventana, most of my team comes from the gaming world. So, you know, we may be a little biased, but like uh, it was Louis Vuitton sponsored the League of Legends tournament last year and they had more viewers than the Super Bowl. So when you start thinking about where audiences are and they're, they're in these 3D spatial computing worlds, they should, that should have product placement, you know, just like we had product placement in movies. Well, esports and gaming, we could have product placement there. And that's like another place for your 3D model to go. So that's, you know, in the next five years, I see that as kind of this long term of everyone should have a 3D strategy from design to marketing. But, but the use cases of that are just going to be endless of, of everywhere that can be. Um, well, this is so great. We can kind of turn it. I know uh, we've got a number of questions from the audience. Um, we're just going to pull that up. Um, uh, will you be able to share the case studies after this session? Um, yes, I will be posting that link in there. Um, and so first question, can you talk about how we will be able to use the data as in how long and how someone looks at the product, where they spend the most time, et cetera? Yeah, I think the insights and data will change um, or evolve in lockstep with the capabilities of the format. And so in the same way that we know, and actually more beneficially, I think, to, to, to brands because the way things are structured now on the web anyway, and in apps is if, if something passes your screen, it's an impression. And if you click on it accidentally or by 
right nature you've you've kind of you've got a click or if a video auto plays right like we have to look at the validity of the data that's being collected today and i think that we have to bridge a gap between you know there will be an adoption period for 3d and ar formats for people however once you've got somebody interested in something that's of significance to them and they're interacting with it that the value of that interactivity um, is immense and each interaction can be measured with you know everything that's a capable a capability can be measured right so it, are they rotating it how long are they dwelling are they looking and you know that you've got an engaged active person uh, in the experience rather than, you know, Nielsen days where you could leave a TV on all weekend and, hey, Dukes of Hazard gets the credit, right? Like, so, um, you know, in these formats, you really have a one-to-one -one, um, connection between the interactivity and the insights and data that get generated as a result. Yeah, something that I would add. So, uh, you know, Facebook and Spark, we have, a lot of those metrics already being tracked on our platform. The one thing that I am personally really excited about is the, the, the social power. Um, so kind of building on what Graham mentioned, not only is it a one-to-one -one relationship with your customer, but something that, that, that we, also, uh, we also track is number of shares, right? Um, so you can understand, you know, if I take, or if I try on a lipstick, I can take a photo and I can also share that to my uh, Instagram story. I can share that to my Instagram friends via DMs. And so that's something that uh, we really believe in, that the power of social, the power of someone's voice, the power of sharing. Um, and we think that not only does that obviously help the merchants, but it helps customers build a deeper connection. It helps customers build a deeper connection with their friends too. Um, you know, you, you can imagine someone saying, hey, does this NYX lipstick look good on me? I want you to tell me, should I buy it or not, right? And that builds these deeper connections with brands. Uh, and, in, you know, it does help with purchase conversions too. So that's something that uh, we're really excited about. Definitely. And a follow up to that. Um, how, how do you have consumers feel safe? I mean, obviously, data is a big issue right now. And people concerned about their data being everywhere. Um, I mean, from my standpoint, I think if whenever you give people a good enough experience, they don't care as much about the data. You know, my, my dad always refused to put his credit card online forever. Um, but now he's get his eyesight's gotten really bad. And the fact that he can just ask Alexa something and she does it, it's like, okay, I'll put my credit card online now, you know, <laughs> but um, how are you guys kind of safeguarding against the, the data collection within 3D and AR? Yeah, so at least on Facebook, um, privacy is, is very top of mind for us. It's front and center in, in almost all the decisions that we make, especially on Spark. And we realize that, uh, you know, as you're using these face filters or as you're trying out a, a desk, you're scanning very personal items, like you're scanning your face or you're scanning your living room, or you're scanning your bedroom. Um, and, and that is all within the view of the camera. So for us, we try to collect as little data as possible. Um, and so we, we don't store things like your face and we don't store things like, uh, you know, when you take a photo of your living room. And those are things that we, we try as much as possible to, to not store. Um, and on top of that, we try to anonymize all of our data. Uh, and we, we make sure that, you know, when, when merchants and creators can look at insights, um, that it cannot be trackable to one specific person. Um, so privacy for us and data, uh, data privacy specifically is very top of mind for us and something that we, we always uh, account for in all of our decisions. Yeah, I think trust is number one, you know. Um, Again, being in the Verizon media ecosystem, we take Verizon's lead on, on privacy and, and security. And, you know, giving somebody a, a, an experience that's of value to them is far more important. And, and maintaining a level of trust is far more important to us than, than kind of collecting information for, 
or whatever nefarious purposes, right? Like it's a losing battle. Once that trust is broken, it does a lot of damage and it's not something that we're interested in really playing. It's just not worth it, right? So um, we're all, as much as we're employees, we're also people and consumers ourselves. And so you have to kind of follow your own uh, compass as, as well as the, the, the company compass, but like, what would I want? Right, um, it is, is, is how we look at it as well. But trust is number one. I mean, it's breaking that trust with consumers isn't worth it. Yeah, I, I would wholeheartedly agree with that. I think privacy is extremely, extremely important for all of these companies, not just for Google. And I feel that is, the, that is pretty much what we focus on and user trust is very important to us. Um, I think making sure what is a good experience for the user without collecting any of that personal information is what we always focus on. Great, um, and another question. Um, does the quality for 3D AR differentiate from an app versus a website? Um, that's a really great question. So 3D on the web and, and web AR, is easier for people because you don't need to download anything, um, but it but it is constrained. So you can't necessarily do try on with pure web AR. Um, whereas if you're using an app, so if you click on it, you know Adidas or Nike's app on your phone, that can do try on. Um, if you're using you know Spark AR because that's an app on your phone, whether it's Instagram or Facebook, that can do do more try on. Um, so there are are differences there, but it's kind of ease of, do they already have the app? If they don't have the app, are you gonna ask them to download it or can you give them a, a cool experience just using web? Um, and with that said, what are um, your dream 3D AR project, each of you? If you could build anything, no budgets matter. <laughs> I, I think it's um, democratization of things like travel and worldly experiences that if we can create an experience once, um, you know, whether it's a piece of content or access, right, and make that available to the world, um, I think that's a really powerful, and I'm giving you a generalized answer, but <clears throat> that's really my uh, hope is that we use this as a, a, a democratization tool to give access to places and things and artifacts and um, I mean, I think that that's one of the biggest benefits to, to this generation is that, you know, you can have any book you want read to you. You can have any person in the world be your mentor based on, uh, you know, Instagram or Facebook or, you know, otherwise their, their own web presence. Um, creating those experiences that give people access to the things that they are curious about. Are, are don't have access from or can't afford, I, I think that that's really exciting. And, um, and on the flip side, it's, it, it's um, connecting brands and, and initiatives and people's um, uh, pursuits with an audience that they wouldn't otherwise have access to, I, I think. So democratization of, these, of, of um, the consumption and the experience is really what's most exciting for me. That's that any project that does that in an empowering way is, is a dream project for me. Awesome. And I think I would love to be in a world very soon where 3D and AR is no longer a new innovative nascent tech. Um, I would like it to become more of second nature for consumers, brands, partners alike where 3D and um, AR is really the um, image or the video of the world where, um, like I know Ashley, you shared an example where a brand didn't really have any photographs, but they directly went on to that 3D stage. I think things like that becoming more commonplace would be the perfect world for me, honestly. Yeah, I plus one what, with uh, what Ipshita said. I think my dream, if I had unlimited budget, would honestly be to fund the creation of a bunch of 3D models and a bunch of AR effects. Actually, this past weekend, I was shopping on Ikea.com and I was like, like, man, this would be super awesome with an AR try-on. I could try out the lamp in my space. Um, and I was specifically uh, looking for an AR try-on and, and 
I couldn't find uh, that many on, on IKEA's website. And so kind of my dream is I, in this time and age, uh, I now do most of my shopping online as, as probably some of you do too. And I think my dream would be don't make me come into the store, please, uh, to, to see how a lamp or a piece of furniture would look in my space. I really want to try it on an AR. Um, so that'd be my dream. Yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you. I mean, that's our whole goal at Ventana is helping people do 3D at scale. Um, so we're kind of an enablement because we, we want to take away that boring work of optimization and distributing this places. So you know, all the creatives can focus on creating the best experience possible and, and sharing their work, um, which is great. Uh, and so um, the next question, a lot of DIYs available on Facebook ad manager and shops is building 3D assets also available or would you need to work with creative agency uh, to develop that? And I'm pretty sure you would need to, to hire some agencies, which I believe is in that Spark network. Yeah, so uh, if you already have 3D assets, so like what Ashley mentioned, you should definitely check. Uh, a, a lot of merchants don't realize that they have 3D models. So in the example of furniture, like you probably create 3D models of a table and you send that over to, to get manufactured. So double check that you first have 3D models. Um, you'd probably be surprised. If you don't have 3D models, uh, probably the best bet is so we, we don't really have any 3D model creation tools. Uh, we have AR effect creation tools, so that's Spark Studio, but you can import your 3D models into there. If you don't have 3D models, uh, again, work with uh, uh, partners in our Spark partner network. They're vetted by Facebook and uh, they understand 3D models and Spark effects and they can help you get started. Yeah, and feel free to reach out to me. Um, know a bunch of people. You know, if if you are a Shopify uh, client, there's the Shopify Expert Network also, um, with tons of people who can create 3D uh, at scale. Um, other than Instagram filter ads, uh, what are some other good ways of using AR and ad form? Is there any drag and drop ease equivalent to a Canva or Squarespace that can help create quick and easy 3D assets for bootstrapping entrepreneurs? Um, one thing I will say, uh, which is getting cheaper and cheaper is 3d scanning of products. So that could also be an option for you instead of hiring someone to manually create the 3d, um, we, we've got a, tons of 3d scanning companies we partner with. Um, so that's one, but then I'll, I'll turn it over to you guys. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think that's our future end state and that's where I would love to get to, uh, both for the sake of customers and also for the sake of, of merchants. Um, we're just not there yet, to be honest. Uh, there's technology still evolving on the customer side, also on the merchant side. So our goal is to be there. Um, with that being said, once you do have the spark effect created, once you do have your 3D models, it's very easy to set up your ad campaign. It's very similar to how you would set up uh, a regular 2D ad campaign. You, the only extra step that you'd have to do is you have to publish your Spark Effect first, and then you would have to link it uh, in your ad campaign. So two relatively easy steps once you have your AR uh, created. Great, and um, I think this might be the last question. Um, do you see 3D AR creating new jobs in the near future as the technology and skill set becomes more understood and adopted? Um, how do you see agencies adopting this as a service? Yeah, I can I can answer that. So uh, something that we've already seen is with our Spark Partner Network, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of we're almost creating a new type of job and a new type of marketplace. Um, as the, the market grows for AR demand from merchants, so does you know creative agency uh, demand too. Um, and so something that we've seen is like, yes, we are creating more jobs. We're creating more opportunities. Um, and that's something that, that we're also really proud of. Uh, something that's, that we try to keep on top of. It's a community. Uh, that, that we want to empower to for, for both, you know, creative purposes, but also for economic purposes. Yeah, I think we're going through the cycle similar to businesses having a, a large hurdle to get a website made for themselves at a certain point in history, right? You have to hire the agency and go through the whole thing. We're, we're in that phase now. However, that's going to pave the way for, you know, ease of, of, of the tools that for asset creation 
um, identifying places that we can curate assets and pull from, identifying pipelines that we can use to convert assets from one format to another. And as the, as the um, standardization happens, now you've got compatibility, so assets can port across experiences. So, you know, the tools for, you know, what became, you know, build your own website will soon be build your own 3D and AR experiences. And, and so that, that's what will follow this first wave of, of really top brands um, getting into the space. Great. Uh, well, I think we are out of time. Um, I know there are more questions in the Slack channel. So if any of you, uh, if you all have time, uh, join me there and we can help answer. Um, but thank you guys so much. This is great. Thanks for having me. This was great. Thank you so much. Thanks thank so you much, very everyone. much. Yeah, yeah you did a great, everyone. great job. And thanks for all the questions as well in there. I don't know if any of you are available to um, answer a few more as they roll in or jump in on some threads in the brand club. Uh, Slack. Uh, this one's in the specific channel, the Apply 3D AR Marketing, uh, but awesome job. Thank you all so much. We really appreciate it.